Welcome to the Kingdom Mandate. Join us each Saturday as we share empowering and equipping messages that reflect on the Kingdom of God according to His sovereign will for mankind to remain in His covenant order. Get your clarion call and follow us on Blog Talk Radio, Kingdom Empowerment, Inc. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Kingdom Mandate. My name is uh, Reverend Dr. Donna Ganny, and we're here um, with our co-host, which is uh, Sister Jacqueline Rogers, and we also have Minister Gloria Vasquez. And we are coming out of the Book of Ruth this week. We're talking on the topic of strange women of the Bible. And this is going to be a wonderful series that we will be carrying out for the next few weeks here, and I hope you will join in with us and and become keen, learn your kingdom mandate for this hour in the kingdom of God. Um, Before we start, we want to open up in prayer. Can we ask our dear sister, Mr. Gloria, can you open us up in prayer? Yes. Um, Father God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord God. Thank you for having us here today with you, Father. We're going to receive your word, dear God. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that we can hide behind the cross, Father God, and that your word will come through pure and holy, Father God, and that we can uh, glean everything that you have from this story, dear God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, your wisdom, your knowledge, God, for your word, your Holy Spirit, Lord. We receive you into our hearts, dear God. We ask you to open up the um, spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to awaken your people around the world, dear Father God. To receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thank you. And I'm so happy to be here this morning, another day, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and who have given us the strength to rise up before him as we talk about the book of Ruth. Ruth, um, in a lot of people's eyes, would probably in this day and time would be considered as a strange person, but uh, according to the will of God, we know that she is not really considered to be a strange person. She actually uh, happened to play a role in the lineage of our uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, uh, coming into the world, which is very important for the body of Christ to know because it tells us a lot about our God and his sovereign will for us man that the way man see things is not the same as the way that God would see it. So we're going to start out, and I'm going to read, uh, just reading uh, chapter 1, which is a very good and important part of the book of Ruth. And in the Bible, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn, In the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, Elimelech, 
And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of the women of Moab, and the name of one was Arpa, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Melon and Chilion died, and, and also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law in that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how they, the, how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. And the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they left. They lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me, and there yet uh, are there yet any more sons in my womb that they might that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should give an husband also the night and should also bear sons. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it it grieveth me much for your sake that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth claved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her God. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. Where thou diest, where I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went unto, they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, Bites, her daughter-in-law, with her, with her, and which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Wow. Um, the book of Ruth is a very um, intimate story in many ways, and we see that Ruth uh, has left her own people, and she has followed Naomi into uh, the territory of Bethlehem, Um, and we can see also that she said that she will go, and she said, thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. So she's not only willing to leave her land, she's willing to fully take on and adapt to a new people, and she's willing to leave the gods of her land, of the Moabites, and 
she's wanting to adapt to the God of Israel, Yah Israel, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so I wonder how did Ruth uh, become begin to know about this God and of Israel, and what did she love so much about it that made her want to leave her own land, her her own people, and travel into the uh, Bethlehem? Let's let's talk about it. This is going to be a great discussion this morning. Uh, the book of Ruth is is a wonderful uh, book, and it has a very good history uh, that we can all ascertain uh, from or learn from. Um, Minister Gloria, please share what the Lord have given you on uh, the book of Ruth, and you can jump into any book. I just wanted to get across the first book, which is a very important part of why Ruth ended up where she is now. Um, Minister Gloria. Well, you know, um, the book of Ruth, uh, on the surface, it's about a family in crisis. And um, on a personal note, I really love this book because it has uh, a lot to do with the women in this family. Um, There's a crisis and the women... um, confront certain issues here and how they come to a resolution. And uh, it appears to be a book just about Ruth, but really it's not only Ruth's issues that are presented here. Her mother-in-law plays a really central role in this book. And um, the life of... uh, the life of Ruth is contrasted with the life of her sister-in-law. So these three women are, uh, the the Lord uses them powerfully in this book. And uh, I want to kind of leave it there. I want to, I love to develop the story as we go. So I don't want to say too much about it uh, right now, but I just want to start marinating it right here uh, with that. So I'm going to leave it there for now. That's good. I really like it because um, it is a very romantic book um, about her falling in love with her newfound uh, Boaz or Boaz found, actually found her while she's in the, uh, uh, gathering the sheaves as the uh, rest of his servants were in the field. So it's it's a pretty interesting book and it has some very deep uh, understanding of the culture of the Israelites at that time, it shares, you know, that she was able to adapt to uh, the culture of the Israelites and and leave where she was. She had become so uh, intimate with it and intertwined in it that she was ready to leave her own family, which is quite interesting. Um, Our dear sister Jacqueline, would you like to share what the Lord have given you a, a, what insights you have in the book of Ruth? Yes, and I apologize <clears throat> when you asked me to pray. I actually had had my phone muted accidentally, so I was praying, but you weren't hearing me, so I apologize. <laughs> we thank the Lord. That's okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, this is one of my favorite books of the Bible as well because of uh, the love story and, and the loyalty of of, of Ruth. But I, 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 when I was looking at this again for this time, because I, I reread the whole thing again, what kind of stood out to me, as Minister Gloria was saying about, it really is a book of the women, but it was, to me, it also said how a woman sometimes has to react and pick up the pieces um, after a decision has been made by a man. Because it was a limitless, you know, in the Israel times, the men were the leaders, they're the priests of the home. They, they, the wives and the children follow according to the men. And as you can see, even when I'm just stepping ahead for a minute, but I'm going to come back. Even when Boaz steps in to redeem the whole situation, there was always order of how they would proceed and to do things. But here, when God sent a famine, it was a limitless who moved to who decided to take the family and they went to Moab. So and as a result of that, you know, he didn't stay and didn't trust God that he would take him through the famine and his people. 
but instead he made a decision to go and to seek refuge somewhere else. And that sometimes is, it's not that it was a bad thing because sometimes we often say, you know, that it might be a good thing, of course, because a man wants to provide and wants to feed his family. I'm sure he thought it was a very good thing, but always is it a God thing. So in that, the result of that, you know, he lost his life, his sons lost their lives, and there was Naomi left alone, and she had to make a decision. But praise God, she realized that irregardless of what's going on here with these people, these are not my people. I'm going to return back to my God. And for me, it was almost like, you know, um, when I I put a spin on it in the natural, like sometimes that people make mistakes and make decisions through God in their decisions. And then they, as a result of it, you know, you suffer, sometimes you suffer loss and casualties by not seeking God in your decision making. So that kind of jumped out at me initially. Before it, before I began to even take a look at, you know, the roles of the women, which in turn had to, you know, step up to the plate because there were not any men available at the time to make decisions for. So, amen. Amen, amen. And I like the uh, the points that you're bringing out there because it's very key points. And one of the things when we look at um, the Moabites, you know, the Moabites. Um, what's so strange about this is that the Lord originally he was saying do not mix with the Moabites. Um, the Moabites extended from Lot sleeping with his daughters. So one of the daughters' uh, sons was named Moab. And so she was a part of this Moabite tribe. Um, but nevertheless, uh, God found her worthy to marry um, to the, one of the sons of Israel. Um, in the, in that lineage, and so um, I, I like the points that you're bringing out there. And one of the other things too is that Ruth clung to her mother. It's like uh, the relationship she had with her husband; it extended farther than uh, the reach of of him just dying. It's like she still wanted to have relations with whom whom the husband had relations with. She didn't want to leave that environment. There was some uh, sincere intimacy um, in this relationship she had with with her husband. And then when um, Naomi, you know, gets to the point, uh, you know, in the part of two, when uh, Boaz Boaz meets Ruth, uh, which was very good, you know, and, and, uh, chapter 1, I'm, I'm reading for the spirit Bill uh, Bible at this time. It says, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of uh, Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth, the Moabite, uh, said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. And then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. Now, behold, Boaz came to Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servants, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young women, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in the charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she, and she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep so that so she came and continued from morning unto now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, "Ye will, uh, ye will listen, my daughter. Will, will you not? Do not go glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be in the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I uh, not?" commanded the young man not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. 
So she fell on her face and bowed down to the ground and said to him, In your eyes, what uh, that you should uh, take notice of me since I am a foreigner. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for the for your mother in law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to the people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay you your work and full reward be given you and the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. It's amazing how... uh, with her taking on that that uh, charge to come with Naomi, um, it's not really a charge because she wasn't commanded to go, but she wanted to go, and she clung to her to come there, and it was recognized and visible by the, the Israelites that uh, she was willing to give up everything she had, uh, opportunity to have access in her own land, and travel behind Naomi and come to this land, and, and it becomes recon, recognizable in the community uh, that she's in. And um, they have, it, it began to spread like wildfire in the, in the land, it appears, because it has come back even to the ears of Boaz. And this is what uh, is, is something that is very um, amazing, too. It says, the Lord will repay you your work and full reward be given to you by the Lord of God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. And so let, let's talk a little bit more about this because it's, I just love the way that uh, Boaz finds her. He, he's, uh, his eyes is just like all of a sudden he sees here's a new maiden. In, in this land, and his eyes, you know, and he wanted to even uh, lessen her load uh, because of what she had done for the mother since since the death of the husband. She was there taking care of Naomi. What what do, would you like to say in that area, Minister Gloria? You know, um it wasn't so much, I think, that uh, that Boaz finds her, but it's the circumstances that bring her to where he is. And, you know, earlier we said that these women were left in crisis, uh, just like this. Naomi loses her husband, and then uh, the two daughter-in-laws, uh, Ruth and Orpah, both lose their husbands. And Naomi was very concerned about the future. And while the two daughters came from different uh, different tribes, they were not Israelite, uh, but Naomi, her mindset, this is the mother-in-law, Naomi's mindset And her grieving, she called herself Mara. She changed her name from Naomi to Mara, and Mara means bitterness. And she intentionally changes her name, and the reason why she is bitter um, is that she had lost, and I just want to uh, to see if I can find the verse here. Um, There's an emptiness. And there's an emptiness in her life because she has lost her future, her progeny. Uh, She knows that she is too old to have sons again. And she can't give these two daughters-in-law husbands. And so she says to both of them, just, you know, go back to your own own countries because uh, I can't give you husbands. And and so there's a, in her mind, She's thinking these two young women need to remarry. And I can't give them husbands because I don't have any more sons. And so she's sending them back to their own hometowns to go find husbands back at back home. And she sees her own 
situation in life. This is Naomi I'm talking about, the mother-in-law. She's looking at her own situation in life, and she sees it as empty. And because of that, she calls herself Mara. She doesn't see any progeny. She doesn't see a future for herself. And so one of the daughters says, okay, you know, and she goes, this is Orpa, and she goes back to her people. But by doing that, she separates herself not only from Naomi, but from everything of the Jewish people, including their God. But Ruth, on the other hand, decides to stay with Naomi. And she continues in this uh, relationship with her mother-in-law. But she says to her, your God, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And in that statement, she puts herself in a covenant relationship, not only with Naomi, but with the God of Naomi, who is the God of Israel. And uh, this starts a new identification, if you will, for Ruth. And it's interesting because Naomi has called herself Mara, empty. And yet this Ruth identifies herself with Naomi. And she goes forward with her into back to Naomi's hometown. Um, so we want to look at what does this identification entail for Ruth now? If she's got, if if uh, Naomi is calling herself empty, uh, but she's returning to her people and she's returning to her God. Naomi has uh, Naomi has remained faithful to the Lord and to her people, and she's going to return to them. And now Ruth has taken on this identification. So on the one hand, she's taken on a culture. She's also taken on God. Uh, so what will this mean for her going forward? Amen. Yeah, she's definitely. Yeah, she's definitely. Agree with you. No identification. Without um, her being, you know, uh, scrutinized or being pushed down or taunted about in a different culture. She's just being accepted in that culture. And the love that she had for her mother-in-law is shown in the same love they're willing to give back to her um, because it must have been a genuine love that Ruth had for the mother because it says that she clings to the mother as they were leaving uh, leaving the place. And definitely Naomi did have her um, concerns about them going with her because she, she knew that she was not at a point in a stage of her life of being fruitful again and, and, and the story for them, she would not be able to provide husbands for them. Um, and because that was a part of the culture that when um, the the uh, husband of one died, same, the same uh, happened and occurred in the tribe of Judah, then one of the sons would die, then the, the, ne- the next son would marry the wife, the mu- take on the wife of that son, so that uh, the generations and the lineage would continue on. But see that it, it turned out to be quite a bit different because when we get into uh, 13, um, after he, you know, had spoken, Boaz had spoken to Ruth, he said, then she said, she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you you have comforted me, and I have spoken kindly in, uh, to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now, she came still with an awareness that she was different from them, even though that she was taking on um, – getting ready to take on a new identity for sure uh, through Boaz, but uh, she came with a thought that, you know, I am not totally uh, the same as everyone else. She knew that there was something different about her in in some aspect. But Boaz, on the other hand, he said, now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here 
and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reaper and, and he put uh, he passed porch grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Now, when in um, with her dipping her hand into the vinegar, in some cultures, if the man dipped his hand into the vinegar and passed it on to uh, the other mouth, it's uh, like a symbolic symbol of love. Uh, but he was telling her at that stage for her to dip. Um, into the vinegar, so that, that it was later on that it becomes a little bit more intimate. Than you get. You call it more like a romantic uh, a part of the Bible, the story of Ruth, and so the, because there's a little bit of romance that is going on. So it, it says, and when she to glean, Boaz commanded young men. Boaz commanded her young men. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be back up here. And Boaz said to her in mealtime, come and come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed porch grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up uh, to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Um, so he was telling the young men, don't, don't, uh, mix or mingle with her. Don't touch her. And also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her, leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned to the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an epha of barley. Then she took up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. So she uh, brought out and gave her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. Uh, Sister Jacqueline, what is the Lord, um, did he show you there? I know this is one of uh, all of our favorite books. Please share what God has given you. Um, For me, um, reading all of this, um, in this whole chapter of uh, chapter two, when Ruth actually encounters um, Boaz and how he deals with her, and even with um, Naomi when she initially had asked them to go back, um, you know, to return to their people, even in her situation, like um, Minister Gloria said, she felt that you know she was. Um, you know, she was bitter at the time because of her own losses that she was suffering. But what I appreciated the most was that she didn't allow her, the hurt that she was feeling, to also to make her to be selfish. Because sometimes, you know, um, in the world of, you know, relationships and even ministry, you know, if a, a sister or a brother in the Lord becomes offended or hurt or what have you, they sometimes want to nurse their pain and they want to be selfish even in their dealings with others. But I respect the fact that Naomi said, you know, go back because she wasn't going to, she knew she was up in age. She wasn't looking to have a husband at that time and, and bear any more children. So she didn't want them to sacrifice their lives for her. She gave them the opportunity to pursue a life and still yet to be able to have a husband and to, to bear children, to be fruitful and multiply, so to speak. But uh, Oprah, 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 she was like, okay, thank you. You know, I'm going to move on. And what she had the right to do so. She obviously didn't have that connection with the God of Israel through uh, the relationship with her husband like Ruth had managed um, to obtain. And she, Ruth was compelled to stay, but Naomi did give her the opportunity to go. But as a result of the decision that Ruth, uh, Ruth now made, that she not only wanted to just um, go where Naomi went and do what she did, she wanted her God. She wanted her God to be her God. And as a result of that decision that Ruth made, God honored that. 
even it, even though she was, you know, from the tribe of, of the from the Moabites, God honored the fact that she could see that what Naomi had had, even in her bitterness, was the true and living God. Boaz on the scene to be that kinsman redeemer, you know, and how he how he dealt with Ruth, you know, it did become um, a romance afterwards, but it was highly respectful and in decency and in order how he dealt with her, how he asked it to not to, you know, don't don't um, you know don't be mingling with her and don't rebuke her. I'm giving her permission to do what she is doing. You know, I'm 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 granting her the favor of God had become upon her through Boaz. But that was the Lord's yeah. doing. That was the Lord's working. Yeah. But he just worked through Boaz to give her and grant her that favor. And Boaz acted like the man of God that he was, and he did mm-hmm. things in, deep, in order. And he, who knows, she was probably may have been um, attractive because he noticed her right away but he didn't allow any of those things to distort the decency and the order in a manner in which you do things about pursuing um, taking on a wife and, and taking on other responsibilities and relationships and things. So I, I was really blessed by that, the way he did it. But he is known as, you know, a lot of times yeah. I hear women say, you know, oh, I'm going to get my Boaz. It's not about a husband in this, mm-hmm. this sense. Mm-hmm. He redeemed her from the law yeah. that they had. Amen. That's good. I like that. That is uh, so beautiful. I like the way you eloquently put it, and also, too, the fact that you are relating it to now, you related it to other areas that um, we can foresee that it's a good um, example of how we can relate um, in marriage, relate in relationships in general that there was some um, protocol that he was following there. And he was not, uh, it was not just a a man-made protocol, that it was a protocol uh, that was established with uh, Israel and he was staying off in that covenant. He wasn't just going to jump rank and order and just move off into doing things any kind of how. He wanted it to be done uh, in the right uh, sovereign will of God. So I like the way that you put that. That was a very good uh, example. And um, we can see that when she returns to the mother-in-law, that she makes sure that she's in care of Naomi. Uh, She's Mm -hmm. not just taking care of herself as as the uh, daughter-in-law. And she sees uh, the the benefit, um, the blessings that is being bestowed upon her by just uh, continuing to have that that, uh, respectful compassion for Naomi she didn't even leave her to the point of in the relationship with Boaz. She she still kept uh, with Naomi, and she still loved her as her mother-in-law, as as though that she was her mother, and which is uh, a wonderful thing there. But I like the, also the point that you brought out about being redeemed, that she was um, uh, coming under the redemption of uh, Boaz. It wasn't like... Uh, she was just uh, jumping off into the um, stage of, uh, you know, moving to the next level. She was she was take, going through the process of what it was taking for her to get there, and she was listening to the being in tune with uh, Naomi because Naomi knew she she knew uh, what was going to a- a- advance uh, Ruth in the stages and what she, what she needed to do to get there. So she was listening and and following the instructions very well so she can, um, and which is a very um, important thing when you are are moving about in in other cultures and uh, other um, establishing relationships in order from the will, uh, sovereign will of God. It it is um, very important that she heard what, and listening to what Naomi was saying so that she would go off into the right direction uh, that, uh, you know, she was given to follow um, and, and, and be able to be successful in, in that, that environment that she was existing in. So I mm-hmm. love the way that she said that was good. That was very good. And so um, Naomi, uh, uh, you know, in, in three, when we get to three, it says, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security of, of you that, 
it may be well with you. And the, and then she says, now Boaz, who is whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. And where is the threshing floor? That was a place that was anointed. Uh, it was a place of uh, uh, consecration, um, the threshing floor. And, and we can see it transited through the Bible in the time of uh, uh, David. Uh, David visited that threshing floor. There were many uh, of judges. There was a visitation to that threshing floor. And uh, later on we know that uh, there was a time that even uh, – Jezebel wanted access to that 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 territory. So let's let's look at um what happens. It says there in three of I'm reading in um, chapter three verses three. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the uh, to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So. Uh, Naomi is teaching her how to how to move about in this environment to to establish uh, her into a position, and she's telling her how to move about like a queen would move in that environment. And so she she begins to take on and follow uh, the nature and the pattern of that, and and uh, it leads her into uh, originally what Boaz. Uh, had intended, but he, he just couldn't jump that order. He just needed to follow that protocol to get there. And so, because he understood what it was, he's not doing it for the sake of man, but he's doing it for the sake of God, number one. Um, and, and so, and she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Wow. Powerful. Powerful statement. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of the grain, and she came softly, uncovering her feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was uh, startled and turned himself and there a woman was lying at her feet. And he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for uh, you are a close relative. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness to the uh, to the end than at the beginning. And in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Wow, look at that. Mm-hmm. He said, now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. So he, he is definitely concerned about following uh, the order of the relationship and, you know, what, um, why, why is, uh, we can say that Ruth is, is strange in the way that <clears throat> in this time, a lot of women wouldn't follow that ranking order. They, they just want to dive to the next step without mm-hmm. thinking about um, the, the protocol and the order that we should keep to remain in the sovereign will of God. They just want to jump to the stage because they see something uh, that they like. But but um, she has been given an order to follow, and she's re- willing to remain in that, which is so wonderful uh, about Ruth. Um, uh, Minister Gloria, please share uh, what the Lord has given you in, in, in that area. Well, you know, earlier we said that this was a family in crisis, and uh they had now come to a place when uh, when they originally left Israel, they went to Moab. It was because Israel, there was a famine in Israel. And uh, in their wisdom, they left to go to Moab so that they could survive. Um, but they left, you know, as a family and uh, with husbands and a future and a hope and security. Uh, they had each other. 
And now the three women come back alone. All the men in the family have died, and now the women come back alone, and they're calling themselves uh, bitter. And they see themselves as empty. And uh, the matriarch of the family doesn't see a future. And she, Naomi, is concerned with the future. You know, she's concerned. Uh, she realizes the men are gone. She, she has a, a deeper understanding uh, than being a godly woman. Uh, she, she knew who her God was. She knew uh, the Lord. And uh, she's got a great concern and a burden on her heart. She's not just grieving the loss, but she's grieving for the future. Because she doesn't see how it's going to work out. And uh, she brings with her now that she, now she's lost one daughter-in-law who she asked her to leave and to go back, and the daughter-in-law decided to, but she's got one daughter left, one daughter-in-law left. And now she has directed this daughter-in-law to, this, uh, to, to the fields of this young man, Boaz. And she says, go there, she tells her, because there's security there, uh, because actually he's a family member, and, uh, you know, he, he's wealthy. He's well-to-do. He's got this land. And uh, she says, you know, just uh, after the workers are done with the harvest, then kind of glean, you know, just pick up what the, the residual that's left that they leave behind, just pick that up. And uh, she gives her these very clear instructions for her survival. You know, don't get mixed up with other people's fields. You don't want problems with other people. Stay with, with his field only. And Naomi is giving her very clear instructions. And in Ruth is a, Ruth's obedience, Naomi starts to get a sense, as does Ruth herself, of security. They see that, yes, you know, there's a way to get food and provision. And uh, they start to get a sense of hope again uh, because there's a close relative and, and he's allowing them uh, to glean there. And he's, uh, you know, in a way he is taking care of them, uh, even though she's considered like one of the servants right now. But still there's benefit because he's so rich that there's benefit uh, for them there. So they, uh, they, they see his kindness. Uh, you know, there, there's some characteristics to this Boaz that are also godly. He is a family member, and um, he's an Israelite. And there's some uh, characteristics there um, of, of a godly man who is kind uh, and who's uh, providing security. And um, these two women are starting to get strengthened because of the characteristics and the, the provisions of this relative, this, uh, this one that is close. And he himself, Boaz, is starting to see some characteristics in this young woman, Ruth. Uh, he sees that she was loyal in, in taking care of, of his relative, Naomi, her mother-in-law. She, she stayed with her. She took on... Uh, the God of the Israelites, and uh, he sees that she's obedient. Um, uh, you know, she, she follows uh, what she's been told. She doesn't get in trouble with young men, even though she's of marriage age, and uh, she's not uh, seeking these younger men for herself. She's, she's just following instructions. She's trying to keep a low profile. She's uh, trying to survive. She's trying to take care of her mother-in-law, and he sees some good characteristic traits in her. And so now these two people are starting to look at each other. <laughs> and it wasn't really that they were originally drawn to each other. It's really the guidance of this mother-in-law who's got the future in mind. Naomi, she lost something big. And although she cannot... And she's got this one daughter-in-law left, and she's guiding her oh so carefully. And she's got this young man in mind that she knows is a family member. 
And there's something about the law there and the, how it works. And she's got that in mind as well. Although Naomi, Ruth, uh, although Ruth is not aware of the laws there, but Naomi knows it. And she's got this plan and she's going to bring Ruth through very carefully. She's guiding, directing, leading her very carefully. And because of obedience, Ruth is following and something is beginning to transpire in this story. And uh, we're going to be continue to look at it. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, one of the things that is so important to pick up here is that uh, she wasn't looking for poor or rich. I don't, according to 10, verse 10 of 30, it says, Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after a young man, whether poor or rich. So she had an opportunity. There were many people in the area that uh, he, he decreed as being rich, and there were many people there in the area being poor, but she chose to follow the instruction of her mother-in-law um, because I think mother knows best, number one. And, and so she did follow after that, and she listened and stayed in tune what Naomi said, not caring about what the outcome would be, but she just followed the instruction. Perhaps she didn't know what that, what everything she was doing even meant. She just followed the instruction, which is very good um, you know, uh, for her. Of course, the outcome is going to be great, but um, actually I believe that she found favor in, in the sight of his eyes when he saw her in the uh, field. Because how did he notice that in the midst of all of his servants, there's a new person here. There, it's not one. And so when he asked who she was, they told him. They said, "This is a na- this is Ruth, the uh, uh, daughter of Naomi." So he he's like he wants to make sure that she's taken care of all of the things that she has done for the relative. He is admonishing that. But but later on, when we get down further on and into the um, story, I, I just want to bring this out again because um, it talks again about this threshing floor. It says, stay the night, and I'm in verse 13, stay the night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, arose before uh, one could recognize another. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He said, what again? Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So um, there were many things that are going on because he's a man of protocol. He's a man of following order. He's a man of character, and he wants to do what is right. And he and so he said, and he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her and said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, uh, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter turn out for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter of this day. Okay, so now we're getting into the stages of the redemption of Boaz. Minister Jacqueline, please share what uh, you, the Lord has given you in that area. There was so much that came out of that, uh, Dr. Ghani. And um, most of all, I just, I looked at, this to me, this this chapter here was just a highlight of of Boaz's character, 
and who he was as a man of God, you know, um, and, and just being a decent, a decent man. I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go back for a moment, but he says to her, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. He made sure that though she came there to the threshing floor, and he was a, he was a man of discretion too, he said to her not to say, not to say any, anything to anyone because he didn't want it to be looked upon as something that she may have done that could have made her appear as not a virtuous woman because he noticed that she was a virtuous woman and he was concerned about her character that it remained intact and he was also letting it be known that this, again, is how you do things because you, you, you come out here. I'm sure he probably realizes, too, that Naomi was the one instructing her because not being from there, she really has no idea of the protocol and the things of, of how they're handled in their culture. And then when he called out to her, I'm going to go back um, to verse um, verse number eight, and at midnight, and now it happened at midnight that the man, he was startled, and so he turned around for a moment because he wasn't really expecting it because it wasn't as if, though, you know, they were doing things in the in the traditional way. He was aware of her. She was aware of him. But there you had Naomi orchestrating things and letting her know that, yes, he's the close relative, and this is in a manner of how it can be done. So then when he notices that it's her, that it was, um, he says, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. So there she, she begins to um, stand somewhat on her own, not in the shadows of Naomi, but just letting him know, I'm, I'm, I'm your maidservant. I'm, I'm here to, to assist you and to, and to serve you. And she asked him, you know, take, take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. So they understand that that is how things are done, that that was, that was her. She was taking that opportunity to let him know that I know that you're the close, close relative and you're like sort of the next, can be the next in line because she didn't know exactly because he had to let her know. And mind you that all the while he kind of, he had to have looked into this prior to her even coming there in the beginning when he found out who she was and that Naomi had returned he had already went and found out that there was another relative. So in him, in his wisdom, he wouldn't even allow her to say, you know, um, you're the you're the uh, the close relative, you know, take me. He let her know, yes, I am the close relative, but there is one closer than I. And the manner in which we do things is going to be slightly different. I'm going to find out if he's willing to take that place and if he's not then I will gladly step in you know so that that for me this whole chapter just spoke volumes about the character of Boaz and he noticed that Ruth was a virtuous woman but he was also truly acting as a man of God and decency and in order and the whole um, marital thing he took it and he respected it he didn't just jump in and wanted to take her you know, come and, and, and be mine, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you. No, he did things the right way. And then when he sent her home to Naomi, he didn't send her empty-handed, you know, because a lot of times in the natural, you know, um, I, I, I looked at this because I'm a single woman, and that whole, you know, I'm finding myself still, you know, not yet married, but I'm, I'm determined to wait on God and not be anxious because sometimes when you're anxious, you know, you, you make decisions that, that are not godly, that are not in, in the order of God. And we have to learn to have some patience, and, and that's what he was showing her. Yes, there's a possibility that we can do these things, but have some patience because it has to work out in a certain order. And then Naomi even came back, and she reiterated that because she says, um, then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. He's telling, she's telling her to have patience, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day because he was that kind of man. He's going to make sure he's going to find out what's going on, what needs to be done. You know, he wasn't um, here just kind of like, you know, playing any sort of games or anything with her. He wanted to know if he could be the one, and he went to find out to make sure 
that this is going this is how it's going to be done and they only knew that he was a man of honor and he would also follow the protocol so she would she said to Ruth have some patience so i that that really really stood out to me and and it really it just spoke volumes of Boaz's character um, you know, uh, Ruth was obviously, you know, wanting to be that virtuous woman of God in the order in which she, she went about and she did things. She, Like he said, she wasn't looking for the rich or for the poor because there were probably some others that were around there. But she was more so looking for, and, and I'm just going to go out and say this, more so like um, the word has kind of eluded me, um, security, you know, in, in a sense of, of well-being and, and being taken care of, and not just for her, but for her mother-in-law as well, which is mm-hmm. why she followed her instructions. So she wasn't really just doing this for her, even though she at that moment there she identified herself that I am Ruth, and but always thinking about and taking into consideration her mother-in-law, Naomi. And he realized mm-hmm. that too, coming from mm-hmm. Naomi's house, and she's here meeting him on the threshing floor. He didn't send her back empty hands because he too was looking out for Naomi. So he was always yeah. thinking of all of them and not just anyone thinking about themselves in a selfish way. So it it really right. was it was enlightening and eye opening that that that's in the manner of how we're to do things because the Bible says that we are to prefer one another. You know, it's not just I about any one of us at any given time. There's always something greater that we should even sometimes consider. Amen. Wow, that's that's good. I like that. That's very good. Um, and um, in verse 4, um, Boaz, you know, he's taken on, again, following, keeping the character of uh, what he know is right um, in the order of what he has been taught um, from his lineage. So he said, now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down uh, there, and behold, a close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he he came uh, aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said, how many did he take? Ten men of the elders of the city, and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said uh, to the close relatives, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, uh, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought uh, to inform you, saying, buy it, uh, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people, if you will redeem it. Redeem it, but if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may uh, know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next uh, after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz uh, said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through uh, his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem uh, my right to redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, there was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redeeming and the exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off the sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people you are witnesses uh, this day that I have brought, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon from the name of uh, from the hand of Naomi, more of a Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead. To per- perpetuate the name of the dead. Amen. And 
through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren. And from the position of the gate, you are witnesses this day. And all the people who were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses that the Lord make a woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah and two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper uh, to effort that and be in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez and from whom Tamar or to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord the Lord will give you from the young women. So uh, we see that uh, this is in the lineage of the tribe of Judah. And what is also wonderful also about the book of Ruth is that, again, um, that is the lineage that our Lord and Savior uh, came through into the world. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's um, what we just spoke about, let's talk about it and, and minister Gloria, share what the Lord is giving you in that area. Well, you know, definitely the spirit of the law, the spirit of the law is there because there are there are legalities that have to happen in order for uh, Boaz to be this redeemer. And what's interesting here is that, you know, Boaz really was the redeemer. There was one that was closer that had a first priority right, if you will, to the land. Uh, you know, Naomi, the mother-in-law, had this land there, and she wanted to sell it. This was her original hometown, and uh, but she had some land there, and she was looking to sell the land, and but this whole time, she's been directing Ruth to Boaz. But she must have known the whole time that there was somebody that had first rights, somebody, some other man that had first rights to the land. But she never directed Ruth to that other man. She was, you see, Naomi's mindset was more concerned about her future more so than the land. Yeah. And she was thinking about her her daughter, which was her, her daughter-in-law. This was her only hope for her future progeny. Mm-hmm. And she has called herself bitter. She's bitter. Why? You know, this woman obviously had some riches. She had land. She could have just sold it, and she would have been okay. She was already an yeah. elderly woman. You know, she would have been fine. She she would have been taken care of. She had some some wealth there, and I'm sure this Boaz, uh, knowing what she knew about him, uh, at the very least, he or uh, uh, she would have known that he, this is Naomi, would have known that he would have taken care of her in terms of food. And uh, this woman really didn't need much for herself, but she's got her progeny in mind. She is calling herself bitter, not because she doesn't have wealth in terms of uh, a roof over her head and food. She's calling Mm -hmm. herself bitter because there's emptiness in her life in the way of her future progeny. And so she's got her precious daughter-in-law with her, and she's directing the daughter-in-law to this man, Boaz, knowing full well that there's a closer relative in terms of legalities, it's the closer relative who has first right. So now she says to Naomi, uh, she says to, uh, Naomi says to Ruth, Boaz will take care of it. He, he will settle the matter in the morning. But as far as the nighttime is concerned, she directs, uh, Naomi directs Ruth to go to Boaz in the nighttime so that she won't be seen. She's still protecting her. Uh, Go to him in the nighttime. And she gives her specific instructions, you know, lay at his feet, and this will show submission. Uh, And then Boaz, knowing, uh, being a man of God and uh, 
knowing the uh, the legality, he understands that Ruth is making a bid, a, 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 almost like an indirect proposal to him. And he he addresses it very openly. You know, he he kind of puts the, he puts the cards on the table. He's not he's not playing around here. He's he, he's very direct about it. He says somebody else has the right here. And he even protects her. He says, uh, you know, don't let anybody see you because they'll, they'll think something else of this if they see you that you, you know, you. She literally, she literally went to his bed, you know, and laid down. And I mean, he doesn't. He's protecting her. And he makes her leave in the dawn, and he says, "Don't let anybody see that you came to this, to this place of harvest." But he does, he does deal with it in the morning. How interesting that Naomi already knew that. Naomi knows the heart of this man. She knows his character, and she's carefully directing her daughter-in-law to this man. And he goes, and sure enough. He addresses the, the other guy. He says, you know, the, the, this was the other man who had the priority, the, the first right. And he says, you know, the land is available. You, you know, are you going to buy it? Because if you don't, I will. And the man says, land? Sure, I'll buy it. You know, he, he's looking at the land only, and he wants it. And he, he is able to gain more wealth from this land. You know, the land will produce for him. So there's a lot to be gained from this land. And he says, yeah, I'll, I'll buy the land, no problem. Uh, and then Boaz says, but if you redeem the land, you've got to take Naomi, too. She comes along with it. And then the guy says, oh, wait a minute. You know, because now that may, infect, that may affect his own inheritance. He may have another wife that he's going to have to share his inheritance with. And this is a man, you see his heart here? This man is only concerned with his wealth, what can he gain for himself, well, you know, how is he going to be able to keep his own money? And he says, oh, oh, no, hold on, hold on. I, I can't redeem it then. So then Boaz says, okay, if you won't, then I will. Because now Boaz knows the character of Naomi. And... He is interested in her, not just in the land, but he wants to take care of her. And he knows that uh, he's going to have to take care of Naomi as well. Uh, he knows the full responsibility of it. But being a more godly man, he's not just looking at what's in it for himself in terms of the land, the wealth of the land. And so he agrees to redeem her. Um, and all of his inheritance becomes her inheritance as well. Uh, there's a richness uh, there. And, you know, this is really about the royal family. And it's really about what the Lord God has done in terms of redeeming his people. And this was a story about the preservation of the lineage of Jesus Christ. This was a, a, a tremendous uh, 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 crisis, one after the other, for this family. And what all the things that had to happen to preserve the lineage of Jesus, and all the things that the Lord had to do to preserve our redemption. It didn't only happen at the cross, but way before the cross even. All the things that the Lord had to put in place to preserve our redemption. And we're seeing here in this story also uh, how the Lord sees his bride, you know, um, the heart of his bride and the characteristics of his bride, what he's looking for, loyalty and love and kindness. Uh, these are important to God. And how he is loyal and kind and provider. And uh, he's looking at our hearts. Um, but all, uh, all the things that he wanted to bring together to be the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ and then to be our inheritance as his bride. He's the redeemer. 
Jesus is. And we, the church, are his bride. But the characteristics that come together, the love that comes together, uh, it's all, we really see it uh, through this story. And it's really about the heart of, to me, it's about the heart of Naomi and her mindset. She, she knew to go back to her people and there to very carefully among them find the husband for her, for her daughter so that she could have a progeny that was godly. So this is what I'm seeing in this story. And uh, she found um, the redeemer, uh, not only for her daughter-in-law, but uh, the redeemer for all of her future people. Amen. Amen. And you know what's so wonderful in um, uh, chapter 2 of Ruth, where it's again in 12 it says, the Lord will pay you your work and full reward be given you by the Lord of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then we, when we get into 4, um, we can kind of see all of this coming into fruition as to why the Lord ensured that they were able to make it off into the land since the word is the sovereign his, about his sovereign will, and the word uh, also is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in um, number four in 11, it says, And the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses that the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. I think I read this before, but I wanted to point it out again. He said to make them make her like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah be, and be famous in Bethlehem. He says, may, you, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So you kind of see that in the, in, in the beginning with Rachel and Leah, in this time it will be a very strange thing for a woman to go through. And the same thing with uh, the time of Perez with uh, Tamar who bore to Judah, because Perez, we're, we're going to be looking at this ne- uh, in the next week actually, um, about Perez, who slept with her father-in-law, uh, Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from your, this young woman. So the offspring, uh, we know, again, it went into the lineage. It was a part of the lineage and the from where our Lord and Savior came through into the world. Uh, God uh, came into the flesh through man into the world. And then it says in 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day with, without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor w- whom neighbor w- women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, and he is the father of Jesse and the father of David. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon God begot Saul. Uh, Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, 
And Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot King David. And before we jump off into this with um, our dear sister Jacqueline and go off into uh, the part uh, where we want to talk about, uh, talk to the body of Christ and share our final thoughts with them, I want to just go to the Matthew 1 and um, kind of look at that genealogy, genealogy, how it carried to and why it's so important for us to understand this uh, book of Ruth. Even though that um, in this time, again, that it would appear strange in the eyes, you know, God's sovereign will sometimes appear strange in the eyes um, to um, someone that has adapted to ways of a different culture because it says even when they uh, came together, it says now in um, verse 7 of 4 of Ruth, Four, it said in seven, it says, now this was the custom in former times. It wasn't uh, really like uh, like it was a law, like it was something in bread that God said for them to do, but it was a custom at that time. And a lot of times the customs kind of passed on from generation to generation because even we see with Abraham, um, he was kind of adapting to things that was in that culture that they existed in. And um, book, the book of Ruth, again, is around that time of the judges. So we see that um, there were some customs that they were, that they were had, uh, Israel had picked up that they were following, and, and this is what uh, Boaz was doing. He was going through those processes and, and following the culture um, as it was in, in that time. But when we get to Matthew 1 again, we look at the genealogy, um, one verse one it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham it says Abraham begot Isaac Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot Judah and his brother brothers now you notice is miss is going to mention Perez here Perez uh, a female and um, which I mean I mean Perez and then we see Zara and then by Tamar, okay. So Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by uh, Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot uh, Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah, and Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, Amon begot Josiah, Josiah begot jo, uh, Jokoniah, and his brothers, uh, about that time, they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jokoniah begot uh, Shiltel, and Shiltel begot uh, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot uh, Abuad, and Abuad uh, begot Alekum, and Alekum begot Azor, and Azor begot Zodak, Zodak begot Akum, and Akum begot Eliud, and Eliud begot Eliezer, and Eliezer begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot uh, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born. Jesus was called Christ. So we see that through this uh, book of Ruth, we can see that it's important for it to be in the um, in the books of the Bible uh, to show uh, where our Lord and Savior comes from. And that's the most important part about this romantic uh, book of Ruth and how um, she and both uh, came about and also to uh, the uh, uh, establishing relationship and order and protocol, we can see that, and we also can see um, in this 
um, that they went through um, certain things for whatever the reason was, and all of it is is, uh, good as we can see that our Lord and Savior came through. Um, Sister Jacqueline, please share uh, what you would like to say about this before we go in to sharing our final words. Um, For me, this is really about redemption as um, Christ has come to redeem us. So Boaz um, given us that uh, uh, example of redemption, the kinsman redeemer, because that's what he did for Naomi and for Ruth. And Amen. that is what God, that's what God desires for each and every one because um, as Scripture says that he, you know, um, Christ died for the world. You know, it's, yeah. um, even Israelites are our chosen people. He mm-hmm. is also said the, the gospel is for the, the, the Jew and the Gentile. And, mm-hmm. and we are not of the Jewish descent. We are Gentiles. And it's not a matter of color or um, ethnicity or anything at that point. You're still a Gentile. But Christ has come to redeem us mm-hmm. all. And he's showing here that in this this um in this story that Ruth was that Gentile. She was a Moabite, she was a Gentile, but redemption was still yet available for her. And God through his sovereign will, like um you pointed out in chapter two, where it says that the Lord, you know, will redeem I'm just um going from what the top of my head I um I turned away from the scripture, but at any any rate, what God was planning to do. And then he shows up um, as the, the book closes out in four that the Lord has, this is all of the Lord's doing. It says, yes, in chapter, um, verse 12 and chapter 2, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. So when Ruth was coming and and telling Naomi that um, I want your people to be my people and your God to be my God, the one true God took notice of that. And he Mm. worked his will so that as a result of her coming to him and walking away from whatever was going on in Moab where they, you know, oftentimes they, they served several gods. But she had she had enough um, in her to realize that there was something about the God of Israel, the God of Naomi, and, and the God of her husband that she wanted to have that in her life, and she no longer wanted to um, continue a life of what she had gone accustomed to because she left her mother, her father, her family, and everybody. She forsake all of them. <laughs> to have a relationship with the Lord God of Israel. And then this, the, and, and as a result of that, God's favor was upon her, and he redeemed her. And he brought her mm-hmm. into the fold along with Naomi, because Naomi was already, you know, of, of, um, of the Israelites. So she already knew what, the, what her God could do and wanted to do. And, in, and she, when uh, Ruth pointed out that she would also want it to, her God to be her God, Naomi didn't continue to push her away because she gave her a choice. And we all have a choice to choose who we're going to serve. And Ruth made a choice to serve God. And as a result of that, and God not just rewarded her, but he blessed her so and he put her in the lineage. So that was great favor that was upon her, that the Lord had that, um, and I believe that was Boaz saying to her, that the Lord, the Lord repay, mm-hmm. and, and 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 God does all things well. We we know that He doesn't He doesn't hold back anything. And He had her to not to be focused on the rich and the wealth of God or what He could do, you know, pursuing God in that way. But she pursued the heart of God, and 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 it was in her heart that she went to to serve Ruth. And to, and to be of a, not Ruth, but Naomi, and to be of assistance to her. Because if we've been speaking in times past, it all comes to be a matter of the heart of, of how, who we are and how we're going to walk this walk that the Lord has given unto us. And Ruth had already made that, made her mind up in her heart. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, 
in his heart, so is he. So she had already made up in her heart that that's what she wanted to do. And as a result of that, the favor of God be, um, came upon her, and she got more beyond what she could have ever even had imagined. You know, she didn't settle for just the, the riches of, of the, the material, worldly riches of what she could see that the, the, the people may have had that were around her because that was just, you know, those were, that was tangible wealth. But she sought out a wealth that was far greater, you know, and would come to her in the long run. And, again, somewhat unbeknownst to her because she really had no idea what she was embarking on. She was a true, faithful, made servant because all she did was serve. She obeyed Naomi. She did what Naomi told her to do. And as a result of her faithful service, she was blessed beyond anything that could imagine. <clears throat> and I believe that's what the Lord wants to do for his people, that he prepared a place in heaven for us. He said the word says, put not your, your treasures here on earth where they can be eaten away by moths and things of that nature, but, re, but put your treasures in heaven that you may have life. And, and I think that this is, just a, um, this is a, a, a love story that God used to convey that, but the love that Christ has for us is even far greater. But this is just a sample of what the love of God wants to do and bestow upon those who will choose him and to walk uprightly and live a holy lifestyle. Amen. 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 And I, I just want to point out that not all of us are Gentiles. So I, I want to point that out, but it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Um, whether we Greek, Jew, or Gentiles, or Hebrew. Um, so uh, I want to point that out, not all are Gentiles that are not Jews. Okay. So I just want to bring that out. And then number, for... for um, biblical sake and for the study of the word of God to keep it in its proper context. So now amen. the other part, amen, to keep it in its proper context. And so I love what you're saying, um, but and in, in the fact about redemption because Jesus purchased us with, with the price on the cross. He's bought us. We're paid for. And that's exactly what happened here because he says um, in 410, he says, moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon. It wasn't like it was a, a normal marriage here. He said, choired is my wife. So um, in those days, there was an exchange. There was a, a not just a vow, but it, it was like you pay a bridal price uh, for the, the woman that you're married. So uh, once you have paid for that woman, you will make sure that you you will want to uh, hold on. And once Jesus has paid that price for us, um, we we will want to make sure that we hold on and cling to that covenant with Him, that that marriage to the Lamb relationship that we have with Him, that we don't want to go outside of it. And because even at that time, they would make sure that once they have acquired them all of the families come together if, if there's a problem to solve that relationship, to bring it into the proper perspective. We have the, the covenant relationship with our father, the, the, the church. We are the church, and we are a bride to Jesus Christ. He's paid the price for us. So once he has paid the price for us, we can't just sing any kind of how. Ruth, now Ruth has been purchased by Boaz. She she can't do things that she would want to do. It's, she's changing. She's transforming into that relationship. And through that, again, she had uh, children uh, that led to the coming of our uh, Lord, of Savior, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, and who's our final redeemer uh, for mankind, our deliverer, our everything in this hour for us be able to inherit the kingdom of God, inherit life in Christ Jesus. And there's nothing greater than that. Uh, Minister Gloria, please share your final words with the body of Christ. You know, I wanted to um, to talk a little bit about this. Uh, the, the first one, the first man that had the, the priority right uh, 
to redeem, and he wasn't willing when he learned that he would have to redeem Ruth as well with the land. And, uh, and the reason why he didn't want to redeem was because he said, you know, he was afraid. He said, lest I mar or ruin my own inheritance. And, you know, I contrast that with uh, all that Jesus gave up to redeem us. Uh, you know, uh, very much like in the story of Ruth, there was uh, something that had to be settled first, a legality. This person had first rights to Ruth, uh, to, actually to Ruth and the land. Uh, but he had first rights, but Boaz, had to, the redeemer, had to get him, the, the first guy, out of the way, <laughs> you know. And uh, it was the same thing for Jesus. Uh, it, it wasn't just that uh, Jesus could claim us. He couldn't just redeem us by claiming us or by somehow uh, purchasing us with uh, something less than his very life. He had to get the enemy out of the way. Because the truth is that we, uh, the enemy of the Lord had first rights because we had a sin debt. We, we had a sin nature and a sin debt. Uh, there was something more to the church that had to be dealt with. And Jesus dealt with the sin debt. Um, I think about this man in the story of Ruth who was not willing to redeem he was not willing to ruin his own inheritance, you know. Uh, but what is, what is the inheritance of Jesus? Jesus was the son of God. He had everything. He had everything. And he's willing to give up what? Everything to redeem us. Uh, I'm amazed by that, you know, uh, and we can see here the mindset of a man who's thinking to himself, wait a minute, I'm going to ruin my inheritance. And I, I think about compared to what Jesus had, this man had nothing. He probably had a little land and he probably think had some kids already and he's not willing to divide that further. Uh, but Jesus not only divided his inheritance, he gave it all. Uh, the uh, the extreme generosity, the amazing, amazing grace of God, and even God the Father who gave his son, he totally gave his son uh, to die on a cross. Uh, yeah. The immensity of the heart of God for us uh, with no holding back. Uh, so the cost of redemption, you know, if... Uh, if we were to think about what would something like that cost me, uh, would, would we be willing to give up that small thing? Um, and as servants of the Lord, what are we willing to give up like Ruth did? Are we willing to give up something or everything to follow the Lord God, trusting him, Although not seeing the full inheritance now, but just are we willing to trust him? Are we willing to obey? Are we willing to go forth with the Lord? Are we willing to give up what we think we have in our hand that might we think it's so uh, valuable uh, to follow and serve the Lord God? And what is it that we're holding in our hand? What are we holding on to? Uh, that we may not be willing to give up. What are we compromising with? Amen. Very good. Um, very good meat uh, that's in the word of God, and we love it. Um, Christ certainly bought us with his blood and made us free from the law. And um, I'm reading in the Galatians three thirteen through 15. It says, um, Christ bought us with his blood and made us free from the law in that way that the law could not punish us. Christ did this by carrying the load and by being punished instead of us. And it is written, anyone who hangs on the cross is hated and punished. 
Um, I'm sorry I picked up the uh, a different version here, and I, you can tell immediately when you start reading it, um, uh, another version that it has the wrong uh, tone to it. So I do want to switch here, and I want to pick it up. We can get it as close as possible to the original root words. Words. Um, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse of us. For us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, that it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, not man disannul it or add it thereto. So um, we thank uh, God for giving us the Son, Jesus Christ, who died up on the cross and paid the price for everything, paid the price that we can be made free in him and enjoy his eternal life. And he also gave us the promise of the Spirit through faith, through faith, and we love him for that. Uh, Sister Jacqueline, please share your final words with the body of Christ. That um, the Lord our God, um, he loves us enough to care for us as, um, you know, when when I I was reading this and I thought back in um, in with Genesis and how God, you know, made man after his image and then he breathed life into Adam and then Adam sinned. And when sin came into the world, but God still yet did not um, allow to remain in that state that he sent forth Christ as his redeemer to redeem us all. And this was just a, an example of, of how redemption can be done. But Christ, our Savior, is the true redeemer, and he has come to redeem all of us from the, the life of, of sin and death to and return us back to that which is life. As the word says, he's come that we might have um, life and life more abundantly. And and this is an example of a, of abundant living as a result of having um, you know fallen off in one area. Um, you know, sin is sin, but anything that's disobedient to God is is in fact disobedience. But God loves us so that He cares enough for us to give us another opportunity. That He comes always to wanting to redeem us, you know, from our sins. And this for me was a story. It is a love story, but it really is a story of redemption, of what God wants to come and do into the lives of believers and unbelievers. Because sometimes even as a believer, there needs to be some sort of um, returning and restoration back to Christ at some time. And I was really blessed by this story of how it showed how um, God never leaves us nor forsakes us. And his sovereign will, he always has a plan to return us and to redeem us back. Um, through Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I really love that. That is very good. And um, I, it's true. It is a, a very good story of the redemption that we can experience with Jesus Christ, that he's not going to leave us out there. He's not going to look at us by where we come from. He's going to accept us into the fold, and he's going to reunite us and bring us into where he wants us to be that we will be able to experience that redemption. He bought us with the price. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, I read, What know ye, not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. I don't know where you are and what you're doing today. If there is someone out there that is listening and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is an opportunity to do so. And it's an opportunity for you to learn about this Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he had. He was, in, he was already in the heavens, a wonderful place. And he came down here to to the earth that we might know him in his likeness and understand that the perfection 
that he has. And, and not only that, uh, he came that he would atone us for our sins, that we might be able to experience and have an opportunity to be, go to the heavens where he is, have that eternal life forever in him. And what could be better than that? Um, you know, there are many places we could be and many things we can think about on this earth. Nothing better than uh, glorifying in the Lord and having a relationship and communing with him, worshiping him and fellowshipping with him. That is it, it's just like um, uh, it was said before um, through all of us, and that is, is that when and I like what uh, Jacqueline said there. It's a perfect example of what redemption is like. Because when Boaz uh, took uh, on uh, that relationship with Ruth and, and, and he saw w- where it was leading to and, and he knew where it was going all along, and so did Naomi. Um, Ruth uh, was following the instructions of her mother-in-law uh, she she had interest in it as well. We can see through the word of God, and, and we can see the outcome it turned out perfect, and it led to the perfect order of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It led out what God's will was, the sovereign will, the mandate that the Father had, because he carried uh, Naomi and Ruth in on his wings, which is grace, which is power, which is uh, sufficiency. He he didn't allow them to uh, be destroyed in the in the uh, desert uh, as they were coming. He didn't allow anything to overtake them. They made it safely on their journey, and that's what we have when we sit in uh, the order of our Lord. Uh, uh, Psalms ninety one is a good and perfect example. But before we go there. I want to open up the lines. We do have um, someone on the line with us today, and we want to please uh, share who you are and where you're calling from. If you choose to remain anonymous, just tell us where you're calling from, and if you have any insights you would like to share or if you have any questions or any prayer requests, feel free to do so now. State it now. Okay. Caller, the lines are open. If you have anything you would like to share at this time, feel free to do so. Okay, so before we um, close out, we just want to spend some time um, in praying uh, for the body of Christ. And Mm -hmm. I want to ask, uh, first, can we start out with uh, Minister Gloria? We want to pray uh, for the body of Christ that those that are experiencing that drought situation where they have lost things around them and they're looking for um, a connection. They're looking for a way of overcoming it and coming out of that situation. We see that uh, as Naomi had lost everything she had, uh, not in property-wise, but in, in relationship-wise, that intimate relationship that she had with her husband, her um, son, was gone. And she she took hope in going to where she started out with, with her, where her family and relatives were. Uh, there may be someone out there that is experiencing that situation now. Can we pray for them? Minister yes. Gloria. Yes. Um, Father God, we thank you for your word today, Lord. Such an encouragement of your Lord, of your kindness, of your love, of your faithfulness uh, for your people who are committed to you, dear God. In the book of Ruth, dear Lord, in uh, chapter 4, verse verse 14, it says, And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. And Father God, we ask you to be, we, we want to thank you for your son who, who has been all that for us, dear God. He's a restorer of our life, and we realize, Lord, that we lose our lives when we are separated from you. But you have given us a redeemer, a kinsman who restores us, God. 
And Father, no matter what the losses are, dear Lord, I know that uh, so many different people have lost so many different things. Some have lost their spouse, others uh, have lost uh, finances or jobs or health or just so much that God is, uh, can be lost. But Father, in you is our sufficiency. Lord God, truly, you have sent us, dear God, the Holy Spirit, who is our helper in all things, dear God. And in that, dear God, you've equipped your church, the bride, dear Father, to be ready, to be ready for the return of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we just pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that in our daily living, moment to moment, Father God, that we will be able to see our lives through the eyes of Jesus, that we will have an understanding in our hearts, dear God, of the way Jesus understands our lives, dear God, that it doesn't end today with our situation today, dear God, but you're bringing us to life eternal. You're bringing us closer and drawing us closer to yourself, dear God, and in you is our fullness, Father God. In you is our hope. In you is our future. In you, God, we have all things. And that we must not live by sight, but we must live by faith, Father God. We pray that you grow our faith in the name of Jesus, dear Lord, that you would give us a spiritual sight, dear God, that you would help us to see further on, much further, dear God, than anything we have here materially, that we would have a willingness, dear God, to part with anything that is here in the physical sense, dear God, for the hope, dear God, and the eternal life that you give us in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, and we know that there are a lot of men out there that are struggling to hold on to that character, um, that protocol of Jesus Christ standing faithful and and, and ha- having relationships as Christ would have us have them. So we want to lift them up before the Lord as well. Um, Minister, uh, I'm sorry, Sister Jacqueline, can you pray for the men of God out there, those that are not married and uh, those that are married, that they would hold on and honor the things that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ have given them to do, that they would not take on the uh, character of Boaz, but that they would uh, learn from those principles and that, um, you know, as the Lord leads you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father God, the one true living God, we come to you right now, Lord God, Humble as we know how to, Lord God, asking you, Lord God, to uh, have mercy, Lord God. We repent, Lord God, for things that we have done, Lord God, that were out of your will and out of your word, oh God. We ask your forgiveness according to those things, oh God. And we come, Lord God, seeking your face always, Lord, thanking you, Lord God, for the men that you have given unto this world, oh God. The men of God, especially, oh God that they may be men of God that would even draw other men into God, Lord God, because there is a need for the man to take his rightful place, Lord God, in the kingdom of God and in the households and the family, Lord God. So we thank you right now, Lord God. We lift up every man, those that are married and those that are not even married or even are seeking wives, Lord God. We thank you right now, Lord God, for the, for the integrity, oh God, that will be with them, Lord God, as they begin to search out and seek for a wife, because your, your word says that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, and he receives favor from the Lord, Lord God. So if they're looking for the favor, it comes, Lord God, when you join a man together with a woman, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you right now, Lord God, that the integrity of God, that even the integrity, uh, like uh, Dr. Donnie said, not to be as Boaz, but just to take on some of the characteristics, oh God, that come forth out of that story, Father God, of how a man is to per- pursue a woman and to, to look after a woman and her family, oh God, his family, Father God. A man, I believe you've given us men, oh God, as, as a form of protection and, and for leadership, Father God, as they cover and keep, Lord God, the, the families, the wives, and the children, oh God, that they, they administer guidance, Father God. And there's, there's a certain aura and a respect, Lord God, that, that is given to a man that's in his rightful place, Lord God. So we lift up the men to you, Lord God. Continue, Lord God, to, to work on him 
in them so that you can ultimately, Lord, work through them and, and your word and your kingdom, Lord God, shall come. Lord God, as it is in heaven, so shall it be here on the earth, Lord God, concerning the men of God. Father God, so encourage your heart, Lord God. I ask, Lord God, that you send forth the perfect laborers, Father God, of course, their path, Lord God, raise up the men that you have called to be even mentors to younger men, Father God, that they can pour into um, them their experiences that they have had, Lord God, in not just seeking their wives, but in being husbands, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you will continue, Lord God, to move in this vein, Father God, that the men will raise up, Lord God, and you will have an army of men, Lord God, that are doing your will. Because when a man takes his rightful place, Lord God, I believe that everything else sort of just falls in place, Lord God. That's one of those positive domino effects, Lord God. When a man stands in his place, Lord God, and stands up against the wiles of the enemy, Father God, that he cannot penetrate the family, Father God. The men are given to protect the family, Father God, and to ensure that their security. So we thank you right now, Lord God, for any man that is listening on this line, Lord God, encourage them, touch their hearts, Lord God, let them know, Lord God, that you are for them and not against them, Lord God, and you desire, Lord God, that all should be saved and that none shall be lost, Lord God. So we thank you right now, Lord God, that you are strengthening them and you are moving in them and lifting them up this day, Lord God, and encouraging them so they can go forth and do the work of the ministry, Father God. So we thank you right now for each and every one of them. We ask you to bless them, to keep them, Lord God, in your fold. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We want to thank everyone for listening uh, in with us on the Kingdom Mandate. We'll be back here again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we look forward to you joining us as we continue on our Walk Through the Word of God, and we'll be talking through this series about strange women in the eyes of men that are in the Bible. They're not really in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of men that are in the Bible. And so we look forward to you joining us again. May the grace of God be with you, and may he empower and equip you for the days to come. In Jesus' mighty name, God bless you all. Uh-huh.